Good afternoon, everyone. Very excited to be with you today for a great virtual fireside chat with Diane Green. I'm Kobe Fuller, I'm a general partner at Upfront Ventures, the largest venture capital fund in Los Angeles. I'm also the founder and chairman of Valence, a new platform connecting the global black talent universe with economic opportunity and development. For those of you who may not be familiar with Diane, let me just catch you up a little bit on her background. She was a founder of VMware, which in 2007 was the largest tech IPO, valued at over $19 billion at the time, and is responsible for creating mainstream market of virtualization and cloud computing. Post her experience at VMware, she sold her company Bebop to Google and took on the role of CEO of Google Cloud, scaling it to $8 billion in annual revenue until she left in 2019. She served on the board of Alphabet, Intuit, Khan Academy, and currently sits on numerous boards, including SAP and Stripe. And very exciting news, as it's taken on the amazing role of chair of the MIT Corporation, being the first woman to have this role. So Diane, how's it going? <laughs> it's good. I've gone from having a lot of unstructured time to suddenly being very busy. It's great to be here on the show with you. <laughs> it's great to really be here with you as well. We're going to have a fun conversation, I know, about the current state of learning, going into your background and tying in education into all the facets of your career and how it's evolved over time. So really, really excited to have this conversation with you. So if we're just, uh, you know, touch upon a, a, a point in your past that, you know, probably don't talk about a ton that's also near and dear to my heart in terms of what we could share is the importance of athletics and athletics at a very early point in your career, which in my opinion is really, really important with regards to how people and youth can develop in ways that you don't really get outside the classroom. And you are really, are currently really deep in the world of windsurfing and sailing. And I'd love to hear a bit about how important athletics has been to you and your career and how it's actually been responsible for shaping you into the executive you are today. Okay, and likewise, I'd like to hear about that from you, but I'll go first. Um, yes, I I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland, which is uh, right on the tributary that leads to the Chesapeake Bay, and, and I was in boats, you know, from the age of one, and I was taking them out on my own from the age of five, and, and, I, and I raced them uh, as I got older, and I think it that sort of experience, it gives you a lot of self-reliance. It gives you, it, you know, when you're sailing in particular for me, uh, you know, is a lot of, it's a lot of engineering because you have to have a boat that's tuned up and ready to go and nothing's going to break. It's, I always sailed with, almost always sailed with crew. So I learned team building and practice and training. And, and, uh, and then when you're in a sailboat race, everything is constant. You know, you have to make a plan. You think you know what the wind and the current and the competition's going to do. And as soon as the gun goes off, everything changes and you're constantly uh, reintegrating the new information and making decisions. Uh, and you have to be very de decisive and, and very realistic about what's going on or, or you can't win the race. And so that was just very uh, formative for me, but it was it was also just tremendous fun. You know, I just loved it and I still love it. And, and so when... Uh, I think sports are something everybody can have fun with and also learn how to work with each other and, and, and the value of practice and being ready and uh, <laughs> doing things doing things well. Yeah, and I, from, from my advantage point as well, it, very similar, except I did a sport not nearly as technical as you as a track runner. So this, I mean, it is a very technical sport, but the variables are at play are not nearly as dramatic as there are on on the waters. But for, for me, a, a lot of it was just putting in time in the weight room, on the track, knowing that if you didn't actually put in the inputs, you're, you're not going to get the outputs. 
And once the gun goes off, there's you, you can't fool anyone. The guards do try that you may have faked right. it during the time of the offseason and stuff. So for, for me, it just taught a lot of grit, perseverance, and is knowing that hard work is what pays off so much. And again, that part of that you get in the classroom, but there's no sort of comparison of being on a sporting field and, and, and getting beat or winning. It's a different emotional response or reaction that, again, is hard to get in a learning environment in the classroom. And that really is absolutely helped me. Be my my daughter ran track and I saw all that. I was, you know, she, I had a little bit of trouble getting her as interested in sailing as I, I am, but uh, it was great to see her at all those track meets and see what she got out of it. I, I, Everything you said rang true. <laughs> well, track is not nearly as fun as sailing in that. It's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but I want to shift gears a little bit because, in terms of you venturing into a career in technology, and in my opinion, the innovation economy is and will be the biggest driver of wealth creation in this world going forward. And for, for some people, it can feel really intimidating in terms of how do you actually venture into a career in tech. And for you being in it for so many different, so, so long, I'd love to hear first off, what drove you to pursue a career in technology and how did you educate yourself to be positioned to achieve such success? <laughs> well, uh, everybody has their own definition of success. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I've always been very interested. I mean, for me, success is doing what I enjoy with people that I enjoy. And I've sort of stumbled into a career that also had a lot of other rewards, such as financial and impact and that sort of thing. But it's interesting, um, you know, I was, I think through the sailing, I was just kind of interested in engineering. I was, I built myself a dark room. I just liked to build things growing up, and 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 that kind. You know, it's a longer story, but somehow that left me studying engineering in college, and and I was still pretty interested in sailing. And I think I had a professor that tricked me into continuing with my engineering education by telling me that if I went and studied ar naval architecture at MIT, I could come back and run the local shipyard where my college was. And I, so I said, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> of course, I never went back and did that. But And when I got to graduate school in naval architecture, I ended up doing a lot with computers. And, and when I went out and worked as a naval architect, I found out that was the most interesting aspect of what I was doing, partially because I couldn't go offshore because back then in uh, 1978, they the women didn't have quarters offshore. But so I, so I switched to computer science and it was the age of 30 that I went back to school and got a degree in computer science. Um, basically, because I just, when I'd been studying naval architecture, I hung out with people doing AI at MIT, and that was fascinating. And then uh, I was enjoying it in my work as a naval architect. So I just went back because I thought it would be more fun uh, <laughs> to to go a little further. Yeah. Got it. And yeah, you went a lot further, <laughs> clearly, in terms of uh, where you were able to take the, again, the, the comp sci degree into building you know, such an amazing technologies that are the backbone of much of what we're experiencing today. I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit specifically around what recommendations you have for people that they just don't know where to start and potentially are from backgrounds, populations that are underrepresented in technology, like what, what things could they be doing to actually better equip themselves, um, resources they can go to better educate themselves and learn how to really start getting into this field, mm -hmm. this area? Yeah, well, I'm actually going to go back even further because of a, a friendship I've recently had with someone that studies early childhood uh, education and how important that is. And and she's now kind of left Stanford to, to do what she really believes is needed, which is parent education and teaching parents how to 
interact with their kids and every parent wants the best for their kids, but I think we don't do the greatest job that we could uh, educating parents about how the brain works and what a child needs, you know, from the time they're born. And by the time they're three, they can already be uh, considerably behind. But, and then, uh, but anyhow, I think I always encourage, I encourage my own kids to do pretty rigorous studies if they could. And and I've always <laughs> encouraged people to do engineering because I credit it with analytic skills, problem solving skills, which come in really handy. That's not to say you shouldn't study philosophy and history and all those other wonderful subjects, but, but getting that rigorous uh, technical, um, those rigorous technical classes, you don't even have to do it as a degree to these days, you can do it online. Uh, really helps your you get better at problem solving and get better at thinking things through, get better at understanding cause and effect and, and long-term thinking. And, and so, and the wonderful thing is how accessible it is today. And also that you can do, do it at any point in your life. I, I, I met a, a woman um, recently who's the CEO of a startup uh, she had gone to MIT and she told me that her immigrant parents were running a restaurant. And after she learned how to code at MIT and, and saw how much easier that was, <laughs> easier a way to make money than running a restaurant, she suggested to her parents that they learn how to code and they did. <laughs> and they didn't, <laughs> they gave up their restaurant and they, they're much happier in their life now uh, wow. as software people. I thought that was amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it shows the power of the, the tools that are available right now online and just around us to, regardless of what age you are, to be able to engineer yourself and then jump into this world of, you know, just technology software and building disruptive platforms and systems that can allow you to not have to you know, run restaurants and things that um, people only thought were the ways in which they could make money and the ways in which entrepreneurship behaves. That's uh, it's a really, really great story. Yeah, the other wonderful thing, I mean, especially if you get into data and data analysis, you can go into it. I mean, you could stay in sports and analyze, do data science on the with sports. We used to do that at Google Cloud and they still do. And uh, but you can just pursue whatever it is you're interested in because being computer literate is pretty fundamental now and and, and applicable to everything. Totally, totally. I'd like to shift gears a, a little bit because I feel like there's some things we're taking a grant for granted part of this conversation that assumes that lots of people have access, readily access to broadband internet and just technology in the home. And one thing that we're all dealing with right now with COVID is seeing how the inequities that exist in this country have really caused there to be an explosion in terms of the gaps of the haves and has nots. And I really can't take for granted the privilege that I myself have and my family have with being able to send our five-year-old to Zoom kindergarten and they're able to go and what feels like super frustrating for us to make sure they're focused in doing their classwork, but they have the ability to be in Zoom kindergarten in the comfort of their own home. And there are many individuals that are, are living with lack of access to basic things that we consider as basic. So I, I'd love to maybe get some of your thoughts on like, what are things we've been doing to combat the gap that currently exists today because it's only going to cause that to wind further because of COVID. I can only imagine the challenge of keeping a kindergartner focused on a Zoom session. Um, <laughs> congratulations. Oh, yeah. And the, the two and a half year old in the back of a potty training doesn't make it easier either. <laughs> yeah. So, and yeah. But uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, even in the US, uh, I think 10%, some over 30 million people don't have internet access, which is, you know, how do you take advantage of a Zoom session if you don't have the internet? And there's hundreds of millions uh, in the world. And so, so certainly everybody, just like air and water, they need internet access. And 
in order to take advantage of the internet and what's there and to express themselves and, and really have a voice and participate in the world. Um, and then, you know, we've got to make sure that everybody can afford the devices they need to access the internet. And they have, you know, I noticed when COVID hit, I mean, even at universities, um, there were people that were better off at school than they were going back home because there was nowhere that they could have quiet and, and full internet access and all the things that they could get at their colleges. And so if they had to go back home, they were put at a huge disadvantage relative to their classmates. And these are the people that made it to college. And so many people can't even make it to college uh, because of their disadvantages. So, and then, you know, internationally, um, you know, we don't localize uh, what's on the internet for very many languages. I think, you know, I don't know, almost all, everything is localized for only about 10 languages or something. And some of the translate work that, that's been done is, is very helpful there. Yeah. Um, I know that's like I was pretty involved with Khan Academy and just yeah. getting everything localized so that a kid in a developed country could understand it and make sense of it. And and something I learned from from the woman I was talking about that that does parent education, it's not enough just to put it in the language. You have to put it in the context of the culture. Yes. And so what you would say to families like mine that live on Stanford campus might be different from what you would say to families that are living below the poverty line. And, and um, there's just a tremendous amount of work we need to do to, to really democratize what's available on the internet in a way that it's easy for people to take advantage of it. It's such an incredible learning tool, but but not accessible to so many people. Yeah, it's it's crazy how it's easy for us being on this Zoom virtual fireside chat and the thousands of people that are participating in this summit to realize that not not everyone in this country can easily go on their computers and be in the comforts of their own home participating in this virtual type experience. And yeah, did you actually study computer science? I did not. <laughs> I was <laughs> I, so I, I, I was a, an econ major, and uh, I, a part of what I also looked like a study at Harvard was other human beings. To be honest, part of the experience was being able to learn through others, and that's basically how I learned the most. And my Harvard education exposed me to people from all different backgrounds, walks of lives, and that's honestly how I first got exposed to entrepreneurship and innovation was through people that basically grew up with that being a part of the way they ticked and the way they thought about things. And I caught that bug and was infected with the idea around how could I think about leveraging technology to disrupt the status quo. But no, I, 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 I you put me anywhere near uh, the coding or computer science and I, I definitely am I'm out of my, out of my zone there. <laughs> but that sort of highlights another important advantage of the internet is I mean, for you to be exposed to those people, I felt the same way when I went to MIT. I was super inspired by the people around me. And and what the internet can give you is even if you can't be lucky enough to be at one of these physical locations where all these people are, you can actually hang out with them virtually uh, to a far greater extent than we used to be able to. And, and I'm sure that's super inspiring for people that that are far enough along that they can recognize it and take advantage of it. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'd love to maybe talk a little bit about that. How do you feel given COVID has also leaped us so far in the future regards to us adopting technologies like virtual events and Zoom and others to facilitate learning and connections. Like where where do you think this all goes potentially in the next few years? When COVID passes, are we gonna all go back to meeting in real life and just abandoning that year where we all were sequestered mm -hmm. to Zoom? Or is this gonna be a new way of learning? Yeah, I that's a great question. Um I, I'm so optimistic because all of a sudden 
you know, we basically in a few months leapfrogged ahead a few years in everybody's ability to feel comfortable using all the technologies and tools. And what that's, and, and then they're being used a lot more. And what that's doing is the people that offer these technologies are, are gaining incredible experience in a very compressed time. And, and you see a lot of research in, into learning all of a sudden. How do you learn better online? How can you have a group tutoring session where everybody interacts? How can you develop uh an interactive course where people do things at home and, and you know do things wherever they happen to be but you're all online and and what sorts of things uh help you pay attention and and what kinds of exercises reinforce your learning and all these aspects of online learning are suddenly just getting a huge uh, sort of infusion of energy and time and, and effort uh, to make them quite a bit better. So, so in addition to everybody getting savvy about using it, uh, it's also really pushed the providers forward significantly. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that all the companies that provide it are suddenly um, have a boost in revenue so they can <laughs> invest more in it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's a little boost. And I, I want to now transition to your now career focusing on, you know, higher ed academic institutions, being the chair of the MIT Corporation. Can you talk about like what caused you to make that shift, take on the role to be the chair at MIT? Yeah, I, I wasn't exactly sure how, how I was going to evolve after I left uh, Google Cloud and I was really enjoying the unstructured time to, to, to pursue a lot of things. I was auditing some online courses and uh, <laughs> doing several other little projects and uh, to, you know, volunteer projects. But I, I basically got a call from MIT asking me if I might do this and I mean, I was just struck with what a privilege it was. Um, I think MIT is one of the world's assets in terms of its the capabilities that are there to to move important technologies and inventions, discoveries forward. I mean, w you know, if you just look at climate change, uh, we need better policies to help climate change, but we also need brand new technologies uh, that will make it easier. You know, it's one thing to force people to do things that reduce uh, greenhouse emissions and so forth, but it's yet another to come up with technologies that let people keep doing what they want to do, but without causing problems. Mm -hmm. And so a place like MIT is so full of creative, talented world experts that you know, to have the chance to support them and see what I can do, you know, to to yeah. accelerate what they're doing uh, is quite a privilege. Yeah. And so you mentioned climate change is one area that you're excited to focus on, at least help with regards to MIT's resources. To well, I'm not going to fix it. All I do <laughs> is support them. Yeah. <laughs> make I'm sure curious. they have their resources, make sure they have the freedom to to really invent, yeah. yeah. I'm curious, are there any other areas you're excited to take on to tackle to help, at least from your position as chair, to help drive change some way, either at MIT or beyond? I mean, one thing I always care deeply about in any organization I'm a part of is the culture. And so the culture kind of goes with facilitating all these inventions. So. Uh, there are so many great things going on at MIT. They, they, um, but you know, AI is another area where I, I'm starting to realize that we need AI. In in that, yes, there are a lot of potential issues associated with AI as it matures, and we need to make sure it, you know we take out the bias and all those things. But, but also, you know, the world has just gotten so complex, and you know, since the industrial age, it just, 
technology, there's so much technology out there that we barely, it's very hard for us to make good decisions, to understand how everything interrelates and what it will mean long-term because the complexity is so huge. And that's one thing that I think artificial intelligence can help us poor mere humans with is to help us see the implications of our decisions and understand the complexities involved so that we start, you know, one could argue that we haven't been making particularly good decisions for the sustainability of, of our planet and, and, and the human race. And I think, uh, so there's a lot of urgency in improving our ability to, to, to fix these things and make better decisions going forward. So, so that's, you know, and then of course there's life sciences and health and a very immediate call to all the work going on to, to get us a COVID vaccine. And that's very immediate. Yeah. Now you, you touch upon, you know, AI as being incredibly important to help us make better decisions. Uh, but I also feel like it's another thing that's really important in regards to how we as people make better decisions. And part of that's diversity and you being the first woman to occupy the role as, as chair. I love to hear yes. your words, the importance of diversity yes. at all ranks of an organization. What, why does it matter? You're on numerous boards and just like how that just is something yes, that's something that- It makes, you know, we, we're calling it DEIC at MIT, diversity, equity, inclusion, and climate, where climate is not climate change, but the climate as in culture. Yeah. And and uh, one, it's obvious, you know, we need the talent of 50% of the women. We need the talent of the races that have been discriminated against. You know, we just need that. And we all, you know, study after study shows that the more diverse a population is, uh, the better they perform. Yeah. And I think uh, the last year with uh, has really woken people up. I mean, we had the, the um, you know, the Me Too movement and Epstein, and then we had the George Floyd murder. And all these things have, have sort of been right in our face. There's just no denying there's a problem. And so it's, I see it as an opportunity to really move, just as COVID forced us all online, these other crises, just as climate change and the fires burning in California. And so also culturally, we have an opportunity to, because it's, you don't have to explain the problem anymore. Everybody understands it. They may or may not, you know, agree at varying levels to what needs to be done, but there's a huge opportunity. And uh, it's very exciting uh, that MIT chose a woman as chair. And, and there's all kinds of things going on at MIT around diversity and to the, and, and uh, that's really a United States, if not international, um, effort, but I I see a lot of urgency in, in a lot of what we're going to do in the U.S. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think one thing that you said that's really key for me is the opportunity, the opportunity around how you look at diversity, not only as something that is just the right thing to do, but it's something that actually brings bigger opportunity to whoever actually embraces it, because those organizations that embrace diversity from boards all through the ranks of the organizations will perform better than their competitors. And also, I like how you focused on that word, seek climate, because it's those, it's diversity that creates a better climate, creates a better culture around those communities of people that are interacting with one another and ultimately learning from one another, learning those aspects those facets of life and aspects of living that you see through a different vantage point of someone else who's actually just walked uh, through you know other shoes and has seen different things. So I, I think it's, it's, when, it's exactly right. I mean, when you are included and you feel safe and you feel valued, that's when you do your best work. Yes. It's, it's the times when I felt like these people wish I wasn't in the room. They think I'm stupid that I kind of shut down. Yeah. And, and so we, 
you know, that's what's so important in terms of climate is to create an environment where everybody can can, can contribute yeah. to their potential. Yeah. And, and that's going to take a lot of work. It's taking a lot of work. I have a few uh, last rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. So I, I'd love uh, a couple things. Like, wh what are you reading right now? I'm reading a bunch of history books about MIT. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, what else? I read this book, Cuz, by Daniel Allen, a very short little uh, book about her cousin who was incarcerated at age 16 and, uh, you know, was thrown in jail for an attempted carjacking for 12 years. And it's just a real indictment of, indictment of our uh, prison system. <laughs> yeah. uh, what are you watching? If you're watching. I'm watching. Oh, gosh. Okay, I'm going to tell you about the last video I watched, which was today, which was Team New Zealand in their foiling uh, sailboat uh, getting launched in the air and crashing, and it was the most amazing thing. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of a real fan of these new foiling boats that I love. Uh, I also watched um, a video of... I forget her name, but a woman just won the prize for riding the biggest wave in the world. She wrote a seven. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just amazing. Crazy. But, yeah, those are yeah. diversions for me. <laughs> yeah, that was good. You need them. And then last thing, uh, you know, f favorite guilty pleasure to treat yourself during lockdown. Maybe it's watching these videos of people doing extreme sports, so you may have already answered that. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I treated myself to come out to Utah and visit my son, and I've been doing a lot of bike riding. It's really wonderful. I don't know if I feel that guilty about it, but um, yeah, I feel guilty about it. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, awesome. I think we're out, out of time here, and I just really appreciate you spending the time to share so much of your amazing background and really really well, really you have one too <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to, yeah you said success is all relative and yeah i'm just trying to feed my two little boys <laughs> but uh, again thank you so much thank you everyone for joining us here today to listen to this conversation and diane really wish you well on your new journey at mit and everyone else today just uh, wish you good health prosperity and mind body and soul during these last final months of 2020 so hang in there everyone thank you everyone yeah likewise stressful times thank you very much great to meet you and i hope to stay in touch yes thank you